Okay, so um, li like I said in, in lecture, the real purpose here, uh, we're trying to just catch some questions that you might have, try to make some sense of things. So um, rather than, you know, just going through the practice exam point by point, what I want to start with is, were there some questions that you had, some things that you wanted to go over specifically that might be useful or um, uh, questions you might have had to start? So, um, you know, if you're okay with talking, go ahead and talk. Otherwise, you can throw it into the chat or, you know, either of you can uh, ask questions as well. So uh, who wants to start? Uh, the uh, um, the zero zero e whatever that one is that that's my biggest problem the or the negative one uh, gamma or beta okay so we're talking about these uh, reactions here yeah that's the biggest one I have problems with. Okay, so it, I mean, I know some of the issue that you're having is, is kind of a, it's a, I want to say a logical issue, but it's, it's from the concept standpoint, we're having trouble rationalizing how that negative charge is there in the first place. Um, what, what I would encourage you to do in, in that case is, is we, we just have to go to the math there. So if I'm looking at a problem like B, where So if we're looking at a problem like B, where we've got a beta particle that's being emitted here, what we really have to think about in beta decay, beta decay, Beta decay is when we have a neutron turn into a proton. And I, I tried to explain it a little bit yesterday. I, I think it kind of got lost in the shuffle. The reason why a neutron is neutral is because it has an equal amount of positive and negative charge inside of it. So neutrons aren't neutral because they have no charges in them. They're neutral because they have an equal amount of positive and negative charge on the inside, kind of like an atom. An atom is a neutral species when the number of protons and electrons are the same. But when we change the number of electrons, that changes the balance of charge and we get positive ions or negative ions as a result. So is the same, so is the case with neutrons. Neutrons have a positive um a negative bounce and so if a neutron loses a negative charge it would be by its nature positive that would be left over and so that's what happens is the neutron turns into a proton in that case and so from that standpoint we haven't changed the number of nucleons the the mass number is going to be exactly the same it's going to be 60 because all that happened is that that neutron changed to a proton. So we didn't lose any particles. But our atomic number is going to increase because we now have one more proton than we did before. And so that's why we would end up having 28 protons. And so since we have 28 protons, that changes the identity of our substance. 
from cobalt to nickel. Now, with gamma radiation, if I'm looking at letter D, in gamma radiation, what we are going to, what we are looking at primarily here is, again, if we look at this M, that M stands for a uh, metastable state, meaning that the, the isotope itself is stable-ish, but not truly stable. So it's got an excess of energy running around. And with that excess of energy, it's going to convert itself to the more stable form where we just ditch that big bundle of energy along with the gamma rays and we go back to a more stable form of that iridium 192. Now the bulk of this energy is being given to us in the form of that gamma radiation. And that's why we call gamma radiation the most dangerous of the four forms of radiation because it has no particle component to it. There's no mass associated with it whatsoever. It's just all pure energy and nothing else. Does that make it any better? All right. We have other questions, other things that we want to go through. Okay. Yes. I, as I was making the key for this, I was wondering when this question would, would come up because we didn't do a ton with this at the time. Yes, Sean, the, the gamma radiation is basically the representation of the difference of energy. That little m, that little m refers to basically extra energy that is on that uh, on that particular isotope. All right, we had a question in the room here about um, this uh, clam chowder question. And so the thing that we want to look at is we want to understand, and this wasn't given to us here, but we again, it needs to be kind of said, made apparent. We're given the relationship between calories and joules in the problem. What we need to understand is that we're talking about kilocalories and kilojoules. They both have the same prefix, which means that if I'm changing the prefix of both the same way, the relationship is exactly the same. So one kilocalorie, is 4.184 kilojoules. The relationship is exactly the same. Now it just becomes a matter of, can we figure out how many kilocalories there are, and then just set up a simple proportion to turn that kilocalories into kilojoules. And so, what we needed to do in this problem is we needed to take the information that we were given about the three different types of macromolecules, the carbohydrates, the fats, and the proteins, 
and turn those into calorie values. So the table there tells us that each carbohydrate is four calories per gram. Each fat is nine calories per gram. Each protein is four calories per gram. Again, these are nutritional calories, kilocalories. So the nice thing here is when we do the multiplication, it'll be real easy to um, just add together all the values and get the total number of calories. So we're told we had 16 grams of carb. So four kilocalories times 16 grams of carbohydrate is gonna be 64. kilocalories. We're told in the instructions to round each food type to the nearest 10. So that 64 is going to become 60. For the fat, we've got nine per gram and there are 12 grams. Nine times 12 is 108. So we're going to round that to 110. And then for the protein, we've got nine grams of protein. That's 36 calories, which we're going to round up to 40. Again, the only reason we're rounding is because um, that's what the problem tells us to do. That's also what um, nutritional labels do when they calculate the number of calories in food. So if I add all those together, I would get 210 kilocalories. And so that answers the first part of that problem. First part of that problem asked us for how much energy in kilocalories would we get from this one cup of clam chowder? And boy, isn't that dense. 210 calories out of a single cup of soup, that's pretty nutritionally dense. All right, so the last part to do the kilojoules thing, now, there, there are multiple ways that you could do this. Um, if you remember in class when we talked about these kinds of conversions, we, we said that there were two methods. There was the dimensional analysis method where we turn this equality into a fraction, and then we just multiply or divide the fraction appropriately. And so if you do that, 210 calories, we would have one kilocalorie in the denominator, 4.184 kilojoules in the numerator. And if we round it off to the nearest tens place, we would get 880 kilojoules when we did that. I also offered at the time that for one-step conversions, if this dimensional analysis technique where you do that fractional canceling, that doesn't work for you. Can't say I blame you. Um, we can kind of revert to something else that we know that might be a little bit more familiar, and that is a proportion. And in that proportion, 
uh, which you in the room can see on the, the smart board. What you would set up is I have 210 kilocalories over some unknown amount of kilojoules. And that would be equal to one kilocalorie over 4.184. And so if you cross multiply and solve, you end up getting X is equal to 210 times 4.184, which would give you the same 880 kilojoules. So either way you go, you end up in the same ground. It's just a matter of preference at that point. And so if there is a problem like this on the exam, um, I, I can tell you that there would not be a conversion part to it. It would basically be one way or the other. But if you were asked to do any kind of conversion, just keep in mind, you can either do the conversion using that factor label method where you, you create a fraction and you cancel it out or you could do it using the proportion method um, and either way would work fine for, for our purposes. All right. Other questions that we want to look at? For some of the uh, mixtured ones, like for beer and milk, would that be a homogenous mixture? Uh, so in the key that I am going to publish uh, at the end of this review session, for beer, I, I would accept two different answers for beer because I think it would matter if it was opened or, or not. We, we talked about this when we talked about mixtures at the time. Once you open that, that can or that bottle, it becomes heterogeneous because now you've got the bubbles mixed in there as well. And the bubbles are definitely a phase that you can see that is different from everything else. But if we were looking at a closed bottle or a closed can, you'd have a really strong argument for homogenous. And so in the key, I actually say both. You know, homogenous if unopened, heterogeneous if opened. Now, milk, on the other hand, milk has been homogenized. And so by that very fact, we would call it homogeneous. There's no real argument we could make for milk being heterogeneous unless it's gone bad. Didn't they used to make, like, when it came in the bottle, you could get, like, the cream on the top of it around there? It did. Um, yeah, so uh, originally before homogenization was the standard, um, you know, kind of going back to um, your milkman and, you know, kind of going from the farm to, to your door, um, milk separated naturally on its own. Homogenization basically uses a big industrial blender to take those fat globules that would separate, which would create the cream on the top and the rest on the bottom. And basically just through high energy centrifuging, getting all to kind of create this one phase suspension uh, that is very, very difficult to separate. Um, and if you look at, you know, some of the more fine kinds of milk, uh, you know, like Fairlife, uh, which has been, you know, ultra purified, they say, it goes through a more consistent homogenization process. And that's where they can kind of help to put together more of the nutritional components, which is why the milk has a higher protein content and a you know, the, those kinds of things. And it also says about like most abundant isotope, would that be the one that has like closest to the same amount of protons? So, 
Uh, for the question about closest isotope, what we want to look at is the, the real trick to that one is comparing the isotopes to the atomic mass. So again, we didn't get too deep into this. We kind of talked about it in passing a couple of times. Um, you're not gonna see a question like this on the exam. Um, I kept it in here primarily because uh, it was something that we talked about. I just wanted to see kind of where your heads would be. Um, but what we can look at is we can look at zinc. Zinc on the periodic table has a mass of 65.41. And assuming that these isotopes have masses pretty close to their mass numbers, the one that would be the most abundant would be the one that has the closest mass to that atomic mass. And so since there is no zinc 65, we would most likely conclude that zinc 66 is the most abundant because it has the mass that is the closest to um, the value there. Now, that being said, to get a value at below 66, there must be a good bit of 64 present as well. But we would know that it's shading towards 66 more than 64. So, um, you know, ordinarily when we do these kinds of questions, we usually pick one that's really close to the pin. So like sulfur, sulfur's mass is 32.07. Well, sulfur 32 is the most abundant form of sulfur. That makes sense. It's very, very close to the atomic mass. Um, again, in this case, uh, I don't have the isotopic numbers in front of me, but I would imagine that um, 67, 68, and 70 are probably only available in trace amounts. 66 and 64 are probably the most abundant ones. And I'd say based off of this, it's probably like a close to a 70-30 split uh, between the two. So that is how you would answer that question. But uh, again, it, uh, you're, you're not gonna see a question exactly like this on Monday. Um, if anything, it's gonna be one that's pretty obvious um, what it would be. All right. Other questions that we want to look at? All right, so some other important notes. If you, if you haven't had the ability, if you haven't looked at the guide yet, um, what you should know, um, some of these questions that are on this review guide 
do find their way into the exam. They may not all be in the exact same format, but there are some there is some common ground between them. Um, so, you know, like I said, I, I, I've got 28 multiple choice questions in there. Some of these ones that are kind of fill in the blank or otherwise might show up as a multiple choice question instead of, uh, or might show up as a matching instead of, uh, you know, a fill in the blank kind of question. So, you know, it is worth your while to go through, do the activity, check out the key and, and see, you know, what it is that you're, uh, trying to do and what you're supposed to do. So I do have a quick question. Yeah, go ahead, Sean. Uh, uh, like the homework, uh, the first part of it that was originally due Wednesday. I had okay. a lot of questions like, uh, um, 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 I don't know how to explain it, but it would give like a, the primary element and then it would give the ones that were attached to it that you have little groups. I don't know how to explain it, um, but it would make us name all, all the combinations with those elements, is something like that going to be on the quiz test? Dang, it whatever like, it's called. It was making you like combine them and like do the charges, but instead of that, you pull it on the file. Right? So no, th this exam, this exam is over. Um, it ends at chapter five. So oh, okay, good. The stuff, the stuff that we were doing yesterday is not going to be on the exam Monday. Um, so, you know, what I would encourage you to do, I, I know I got, a, I got a couple of messages last night, uh, some people that were struggling a little bit, um, with, with the homework that was due, what, what I would encourage you to do, bring some of those questions with you on Tuesday, and we'll try to kind of make some sense of them, uh, before we finish up chapter six and, and the molecular stuff. Um, so, you know, as far as the chapter six quiz is concerned, um, yes, there, uh, there are going to be naming questions on the chapter six quiz. Uh, that's kind of a big part of what chapter six is all about. Um, you will be given that chart. So, um, yeah, I... Uh, if, if that's something we want to talk about right now, we, we can, if we're out of questions about the exam, I, I just don't want to, I don't want to monopolize the time I set aside for reviewing to, to look at homework unless we've got nothing further to discuss. All right. Um, does anyone on Zoom have an objection? There's no objections here in the classroom. All right. Um, All right, so uh, I'm going to keep recording uh, just because, um, you know, it might help somebody else um, to, to look at the, this, but um, I'm going to pull up the chapter six homework. If you've got stuff you want to talk about specifically, we've got about 20 minutes. Uh, we can... We can go through some of that stuff, uh, try and make things better. Again, it's 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 not going to affect Monday at all. Um, but if 
if this is kind of a sticking point, uh, we we have the ability, we're all here. Uh, we might as well take a look at it if we've got nothing else to talk about. I'm actually going to have to get off here, but thank you, sir. I appreciate your help. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, check out the YouTube later. It'll, uh, this discussion will be on there. It sounds like, at least from those that are, are participating, um, it sounds like this was a common point of contention. So uh, we'll, we'll use our time wisely here. Thanks, sir. See you on Monday. All right. Sounds good. See you, Sean. All right. So for the two of you that are here, I know we can't see anything that I'm doing right here. So um, if you have it on your laptop and you want to talk about a specific item, just let me know and I'll, I'll, I'll write out my solutions here as I'm talking about them there. Unfortunately, um, when it comes to the polyatomic ions, there is no real uh okay let's start with these two these two seem to be the biggest bones of contention 13 and 14. yeah yeah i'm just looking at the kind of the average grades going okay yeah we struggled with that i think we struggled with it because it was asking me for them like all at once i just wanted to separate the commas yeah yeah so okay. Yeah, that that could that could end up being what it was. Um, okay, so yeah, if we're looking at something like um, fourteen, uh, you know, part A, um, it's asking you to enter the formulas of compounds formed by specific cations with uh, a variety of anions. Now, um, I know that this one has a randomizer on it, so not everybody got exactly the same thing. Um, but the concept should be about the same. And so what you needed to do, so the example it's showing me, um, We've got ammonium ion, NH4 plus. And with uh, permanganate. And we're supposed to answer them consecutively using commas. So the thing that we want to do, this is, this is exactly the thing we were working on in lecture, was we want to pair up those ions and we want to see, okay, how do they fit together? Well, in this case, ammonium ion, NH4, is positive one. Hydroxide ion, OH minus, is negative one. Their charges match. The formula should be NH4OH. For the second one, we've got NH4 plus pairing up with permanganate ion, MNO4 minus. And again, the charges match, plus one, minus one. The formula would be NH4 MNO4. 
And so what I would do is I would put in those two formulas consecutively with the commas, NH4OH, comma, NH4, MNO4. Now, you know, believe it or not, um, you know, one thing I get to see on my side of mastering is I get to see, you know, how you do compared to how the average student who uses the same textbook does. And what's what's really remarkable is the the fact that uh, again you guys can't see this, but um, if I'm looking at the averages you guys versus the average you actually did a little bit better um this is just a hard question in general um what was wrong yeah i'm seeing a couple of different things um that's probably got to do with just a misinterpretation What's important for us to know here though, is that we didn't need parentheses for any of these. And the reason we didn't need parentheses is because we didn't multiply either of these ions in terms of the total number of ion that was needed. It was one and one. We only really need the parentheses if we're talking about needing two of one of the clusters or three of one of the clusters or something along those lines. And so if you look at part B, um, this is probably where we're getting into more of that kind of trouble because now we're getting into, instead of pairing ammonium ion with negative one charged ions, we're pairing it with negative two charged ions. The carbonate ion and the chromate ion. And what we have to recognize there, this is where we can do that crisscrossing. So if I'm looking at ammonium ion, NH4 plus, and carbonate ion, CO3 negative two, I can crisscross those to get the correct formula. The charge of two is going to go around the ammonium ion to make NH42. And we would have just one CO3. And similarly, the NH4 plus and the chromate would do a similar kind of dance, I would need two NH4s and one CRO4. And so again, we would take those two and we would separate them by commas uh, to get the, the answer there. And so it looks like, you know, from a, from a standpoint of where did we make kind of the most mistakes, it is in the placement of those parentheses and those subscripts. Mistaking the four here as a subscript for the entire NH ion, as opposed to it's just a subscript for the hydrogen. And so it looks like it just kind of continues from there we're doing the same kinds of things. So the next pairing or group of pairings was the aluminum ion with hydroxide and permanganate.
And so recognizing there that we also moved crisscross and get three hydroxides, one aluminum, and we need parentheses around the hydroxide since there are now three of them. And same thing, we've got aluminum and permanganate. If we cross those out. I need one aluminum and three permanganates. And so I'd have to enter those two answers um, kind of simultaneously there, um, separated by commas again. And so, uh, you know, I can just see more you know, more of the same kind of here. We're just kind of repeating the, the, the same things here kind of over and over and over again. So really just as a matter of taking whatever charge we're given, crossing it out and making sure that we put that, that subscript on the outside of the entire ion in parentheses, as opposed to just a piece of it or changing changing just the subscript of one of them. I had one question where it was like, I got it right, but it wanted me to like simplify the ratio. So what instead of like, you know, four and two, I need to like two and one. Right. Now something we talked about at, at the end of kind of the ionic unit. So, um, you know, part F here. Um, yeah, which we really struggled with and I can imagine, yeah. Most of the struggles we had were we did the crisscrossing, but we forgot to reduce. Um, so in that case, we had the ions were lead four plus. And carbonate or chromate. And so if you, if you cross the charges, you would get PB2CO3 taken four times. This was something that we touched on yesterday. We didn't do many examples with it, though. If my subscripts here are reducible, that means that they can each be divided, usually by two, then we would reduce them. And so since both of those factors are divisible by two, we reduce the fraction basically to get the correct, the ratio is the same. Four to two is the same as two to one, but we simplify in the process. And so if I had four plus and two negative, you got, I, I get this out of my crossing the charges, but I need to recognize that those are reducible. And so when I reduce them, it becomes just a one to two ratio instead of a two to four ratio. And I would get the same kind of logic with the chromate as well, because it's four to two also. So if I did PB2CRO4 taken four times, I would have to recognize that the two and the four are reducible as well. And so PB, CRO4 taken twice would be the correct 
version of that. So I'm not necessarily surprised that this particular assignment gave a little bit more of a struggle than most of the other ones are. This is a concept that just requires a lot of practice. And so um, what you'll find is that, you know, molecular nomenclature is a good bit easier. It's easier to kind of wrap our heads around. There are fewer rules associated with it, fewer variations. It's just a matter of, you know, prefixes. Um, so that part will get easier for us. This is the part of the chapter that really is going to require the most of our attention. And unfortunately, you know, with the schedule being what it is, we only had a week to do it and we're kind of, we're going to push it to a week and a half by the time we're done. Um, and so we'll just, we'll make do with what, what it is by that point and, and, and take it from there. So that was question 14. I'm guessing question 13 is similar. Yeah. Yeah, question 13 is similar. I think it's just, um, I'm guessing what's happening here is we're just the, yeah, the issues we're having are with the formatting and with making sure that we're entering all of the answers in consecutively. Because I'm looking at the, you know, what was counted as wrong. And yeah, half of the wrong answers were just wrong interpretations of the answer. Um, All right, was there any other homework problem that was specifically difficult um, that would benefit from a couple of minutes of review? I had a couple of comments about question 15 here um, where you had to enter the formula of the polyatomic ion and kind of break it down. Um, what you had to recognize in that question. So, you know, for example, it told us, okay, here, here's a compound, sodium carbonate, Na2CO3. Um, what is the polyatomic ion? Well, that's a recognition thing. This is where we have to go to our chart and see, hey, sodium's not a polyatom, it's just an element. Is CO3 a cluster? And if we go to the chart that we were looking at, we should see pretty easily, yeah, CO3 is one of those clusters. It's got a negative two charge on it. So carbonate as CO3 negative two, that's what we should have put down as the answer in part A there. Part B just asked us to name that. Everybody got that question right. Wouldn't have expected anything different. And then part C and, and, and D, I'm guessing, are similar. Yeah, so part C, you were given this compound, NH4, 2, um, O, so again, recognizing oxygen is not a polyatom, NH4 is. I go to the chart, I look for NH4, I find NH4 plus, that's the ammonium ion. Most of the errors in here were, were formatting ones. Putting on the wrong charge, putting the four as part of the charge instead of subscript, little things like that, being able to name. Yeah. 
So that seems to be what the rest of this was as well. You know, did really strong with the naming parts, had a little bit of difficulty identifying the ions. All right. Well, we're, we're about out of time. Uh, so for those of you that are still there on Zoom, thanks for coming in. Um, if any questions pop up all, over the weekend, feel free to reach out to me, send me a remind message or um, an email. I'll try to get back to you as quick as I can. Um, otherwise, um, I will be in my office on Monday before the exam. So I've got my two office hours at 11 and one. I'll be around the building at the other times as well. So day of the exam, if you wanna pop in and ask a question, just knock on my door, I'll be there. Have a good weekend. Um, for the homework, I did like half of it and I got the polyatomic ion part stopped. Okay.